Oh, welcome to the latest edition of TV on the Net. I'm your host, Tom Vartanian. Today's show brought to you by AmeriQ Credit Union for every day, for everything. Located next to Little Caesars at 3944 Route 281 in Cortland. By Rhino Creek Farm and Marathon. All natural, pasture-raised Angus beef from our farm to your table. By the Cortland Voice, the exclusive media partner of TV on the Net. For all your local news and sports in Cortland County at no cost to you, check out CortlandVoice.com. By the Royal Auto Group on Route 281 in Cortland, the home of no hassle, no razzle-dazzle. Check them out at RoyalAutoGroup.com. And by Yemen Real Estate at the entrance to Yemen Park off I-81, exit 11 in Cortland. Well, joining me today is a guy I got a chance to talk to before I left my uh, previous job. And uh, he did that year, he was just becoming his first year as the full-time quarterback coach for the Cincinnati Bengals. Now he's got a year under his belt. And hopefully have you know another year with Joe Burrow now, which will be exciting as well. But joining us today, uh, a Cortland High graduate from uh, 2005, Dan Pitcher. Welcome. Great to be with you. So as we said, uh, we'll, we'll, let's see. Let's talk about that. We kind of were talking about it before we started doing the, the cast here. Um, yeah, hopefully maybe this year will be a little bit more normal. You know, fans are going to be allowed back in the stadiums as of now. Full, you know, full capacity stadiums and. Uh, Will it, will it seem more like a football season compared to what you guys went through last year? Sure, that's the hope. You know, it was uh, it was a bizarre year uh, for everyone and and in all sorts of industries, and certainly ours was no different. You know, we're used to playing in front of stadiums full of seventy thousand people, and uh, you know, then last year there were times when there was nobody, and times when there were. 10% of that. So it'll be nice to get back to, um, you know, playing in front of full stadiums and, you know, cause we all know how big, uh, how big of an impact the fans play, you know, at the professional level. So that'll be good. As you said, a 2005 graduate from Cortland high, a three sport athlete there, football, basketball, and a baseball career there. Uh, so talk back a little bit about, uh, what do you remember from your uh, football playing days with the purple tigers? Well, a long time ago now, um, you know, I remember, you know, it's, it's tough to remember specific games or, or things like that. You know, it's you, you, the more, you know, you kind of just remember in a general sense, you know, playing with your friends and, um, you know, having a good time and throwing the ball around a little bit. And, um, you know, I do remember, uh, do remember getting the best at home or at least once. I can't remember how many times that happened, but it, it definitely happened at least once. I think my last year. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's just, it was, uh, fun times and, um, you know, got to be around some, some really good people. And of course you ended up, like we say, your career ends up going to football, but also play basketball and baseball, but you actually got, you can, uh, well, we'll do this for you. Why don't we talk? Yeah, we'll talk about how about, you know, basketball. What do you remember from uh, your basketball days with Cortland? Sure. Um, had had some some pretty good teams. Um, I think if I remember correctly, our sophomore year, we we lost in the sectional finals to James L. DeWitt. Um, you know, I just remember uh, learning a lot from from Coach Lowey. Um, you know, he's he's one of the one of the better coaches I've had in my career in any uh, stop and in, in any sport. Um, and um, so just playing with some, some, some good, you know, talented guys and, and, and guys that are still friends to this day. And, um, you know, I, my first love was basketball. Um, and then, you know, I, I came quickly to the realization that uh, as a five foot 11 guy that couldn't run very fast or jump very high, that uh, maybe, maybe another Avenue was better for me. Uh, but uh, I had a lot of fun playing hoops and, um, you know, definitely enjoyed my time playing basketball, Cortland. And uh, finally, of course, uh, in the spring, it was baseball season for you guys. Cortland, the boys this year, just uh, lost in the sectional final, I believe. Had a good season, lost in the sectional finals this year. But uh, that's all they had was sectionals, too. They didn't have anything more to go on to afterwards anyways. But uh, what are your, your baseball days like? Uh, it's more of the same. Um, you know, baseball for me was <clears throat> was always a very – welcome departure from the, I guess, the intensity um, and the physicality of a sport like football. Uh, baseball is kind of the opposite for me, um, where, you know, you, you got a chance to play more games, but at, at a different, um, you know, you're just focused on different things. It's much more of a one-on-one -on -one battle. Um, you know, it's not, it doesn't take the same toll as 
the game of football uh, takes on your body. Uh, but it's equally as difficult for, for different reasons. Um, so, you know, I, I, I love playing for Coach Tobin and, um, you know, definitely had, had buddies on that team that were a lot better players than I was, and, and they went on to play in college, um, you know, and so it's good playing with them. And, but I, I remain a huge baseball fan to this day, um, you know, and kind of become a little bit of a Cincinnati Reds fan, me being in Cincinnati now, so they've been fun to follow. But, uh, again, you know, playing three sports at Cortland uh, definitely – uh, helped me get to where I am today. Um, and, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it any differently if I could go back and change it. I wouldn't. Uh, so it's, I, I definitely enjoy those experiences. What would you, what would you take away as, you know, outside of the playing career? What, what will you take away that you learned and uh, took with you as you moved down from Portland? Well, I just think <clears throat> there's no substitute for, uh, for competition. And it's, to me to have the opportunity to compete year round uh, as opposed to maybe specializing in, in one or two sports and then having a substantial part of the year where you're strictly training for that sport. I think that the, the competitive element that's built when you're always competing uh, is something that carries over into your life after you're done as a competitive athlete. Um, it's definitely something that I, I have with me to this day. It's why I do what I do. Um, and it's that competitive fire that you got to wake up every day and go earn your job. Someone's trying to take it from you. You have to go earn it. Um, and I think when you, when you play multiple sports as a kid growing up and, and there's always, the, there's a game feels like every other day, you know, for 365 days, you're playing something competitively. I think that there's tremendous value in that. <clears throat> so, you talk about like legendary, you know, we, we joke. I, I say this a lot with coaches, the guy that I've been talking to, you know, coaches, two legendary, especially legendary coaches there at Cortland High with Mick Lowey and John Tobin. Um, roundabout way through college, found your way back at SUNY Cortland at the end of your, uh, for three seasons, including your grad grad year and played under another coach that just retired. Uh, and, uh, you know, just over a year ago, uh, Coach McNeil. How, what, how, what got, you know, what ended up, you know, bringing you, you know, the, the roundabout way, you know, to, uh, end up with the red dragons um yeah that's a that's a really good question and it's a it's a it's a nice story that I like to tell so when I was coming out of high school I actually had an opportunity with my family to sit down and meet with coach McNeil and at the time I was really considering um you know a lot of one double a programs ultimately I chose Colgate University um and 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 really kind of was trying you know had a goal had you know a personal goal to play at the highest level I could play at and so uh, Coach McNeil, knowing that, still took time out of his day to kind of meet with us, talk about the process, what I could expect, what to what, you know look out for, pitfalls that, that that kids make throughout the process. And so he did that really. I, I can't imagine that he had much intention of me joining his program at that point in time, but he did it anyway. Um, and that went a long way with me when two and a half years later, I was transferring out of Colgate and, and looking for a program to continue my playing career. And I remembered that experience. Um, and that's something that, you know, is a lesson in and of itself, where if you just are, if you're a good person and you, and you are willing to help people, uh, even when there's not, you know, a, a pot at the end of the rainbow for you, maybe necessarily at that point in time, that in, in the long run, being that way, will will come back around positively for you. And, and so for coach McNeil, it meant that now, you know, two years later, my circumstances had changed and I, I was ready. I, I was hopeful that he would, you know, want me to join his program. And, 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 you know, uh, thankfully he did. And, um, you know, and I was able to go on and, and do some good things there at Cortland. So it, it was, um, you know, coming out of high school, didn't really consider playing f- you know, college football in my own backyard, but uh, circumstances changed a couple years later, and I was excited to do it. <laughs> and of course, uh, you played played as a grad assistant. Your, uh, you know, the, the one year in that, uh, actually, your quarterbacking career turned out really well with the with the Red Dragons. And of course, you were in the running for the uh, Gagliardi Trophy in Division Three, which is Division Three's equivalent of the Heisman Trophy. So. Uh, yeah, you want to talk playing at elite level, and here you are being considered one of the elite players in all of uh, Division Three college football. Yeah, it was. Uh, you know, I I, <laughs> I joked that 
you know, that year I, I played, you know, I did, I had a really good year and I felt like I played really well, you know, and it was, you know, but for me, that was my seventh year out of high school. You know, I, I was, um, you know, with the transfer and a couple different medical red shirts and injuries that I battled through, you know, I got, you know, I guess you could call it fortunately or unfortunately, I got to extend my career. Um, and so at that point in time, you know, I was really, you know, I felt like I was playing at a very high level mentally. Uh, because I had had, you know, really the benefit of a couple additional seasons that most most college athletes don't get, um, and so that was a that was a tremendous help to me uh, at the end of my career there when I was able to have that you know the season that you referenced with the Gallardi nomination. Um, but uh, you know it was it, it was a great program under coach. Um, you know had every opportunity in the world to to succeed and and you know thankfully was able to to do some good things. <laughs> And at that point, I remember, I remember the Jets were in camp for the summers during, during your, uh, your years at Cortland State. And I know, uh, I know you joke, we, they, you know, kind of joke, you, you got involved kind of, you know, helping uh, kind of, you know, one of those behind the scene guys with the Jets during the, their tenure there. So that gave you your first uh, kind of taste of what pro football was like. Absolutely. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, it was a, it was a great opportunity um, for a couple of weeks to intern there with the Jets. Uh, I did it, I believe, two summers, um, you know, and, and it was, it's exactly what you said it was. It was a glimpse into what pro football looks like, um, you know, the, the standards that those guys are held to and, and the resources that are, that are put into, you know, the, the teams at that level. And, you know, for me, it was just, it was kind of an affirmation of, all right, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to be around. Um, you know, this is what I want to make my career. And so uh, it was definitely a valuable uh, glimpse into, you know, what has now become, um, you know, my, my career. Were there any thoughts when you were finishing off that grad, grad year at Cornell State that maybe somebody would take a shot at you, maybe you'd get drafted and play a little bit of pro football? Um, you know, not really. Um, you know, I was pretty, you know, I, as I kind of referenced before, I've always been pretty realistic about, you know, I feel like I worked very hard and I got a lot out of my uh, God given ability. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> these guys that play at this at the highest level, uh, they're a lot of, you know, they're, they're just different. Um, you know, they're bigger, they're faster, they're stronger. And, uh, you know, so I I had I actually you know, I had a couple opportunities to continue playing overseas, um, one in France, one in Germany. Um, but I you know, I kind of chose to forego those, you know, in order to start my career um, as a coach. So it was, you know, I never really had, um, you know, that was a fun year and it was nice to get some recognition, but I, you know, I never really expected that it would lead to much in the way of a professional opportunity. And what was Coach McNeil like? Like I said, he, you know, he, he retired just, you know, just, you know, before last season, the COVID season, he, he's, stepped down and Kurt Fitzpatrick came in and took over the program and wait, he's looking forward to his first fall season of actually coaching a team. You know, he kind of had to go through the motions last year as a, a coach without a, a season to, to, you know, but have guys get ready for a season. Um, what was it like, you know, playing with, under coach McNeil? You know, he, he was an excellent coach. Um, and I would say he took his role as a developer of, young men as serious or, or more serious than even that of uh, a head football coach. Um, and I just, you know, remember that just about every time he got up and talked in front of the team, there was some lesson, some uh, value that he was trying to instill uh, in the group that stood, you know, or sat in front of him listening to him speak. And, um, you know, those things are, you know, it wasn't lost on me to, to kind of hear him get up there and, and take that approach day after day after day, because those are the things that last, you know, they last more than wins and losses. They last more than records and all those things is okay. How, you know, I've, I've been put in this position as, and, and he was, you know, in that position for so long where I can make this positive impact on a lot of individuals on their way through my program. And I think he, he kind of, you know, he really tried to do that every day. Um, and so that's something I really appreciated about playing for coach McNeil um, something that hopefully I, I'm able to do, you know, in my career going forward as well. And that that relationship you built with Coach McNeil, going all the way back to college, you know, your high school, you know, you know, when you're looking to go college, 
kind of paid off because you actually got your first coaching job uh, working with Coach McNeil and uh, Cortland, uh, Cortland State before you moved on to the uh, the Coles. Yeah, yeah. No, I was I pretty quickly, you know, I was I was volunteering and coaching the wide receivers in spring ball, you know, three months after I had gotten done playing. Um, and, and I was grateful to coach for that opportunity because, you know, that's a, that can be a little bit of a unique transition where all of a sudden, you know, I was teammates with these guys. And then very quickly now I'm now in a position of authority as, as somebody working with one of those position groups. But I think they all kind of respected me um, in that way as a player. As I referenced before, I was six and seven years older than some of them. So they probably showed up to, to camp when I was a player and wondered who this, you know, slightly graying 24 year old guy is that uh, is playing with them. Uh, you know, he's, he looks more like a coach anyway. So I think that transition for the the players probably wasn't too hard um, to view me in that light. Uh, and then, yeah, it was just a good, good start, good way to kind of, in a in a familiar setting to begin my career. And then, um, you know, as you mentioned, kind of quickly move on to Indianapolis from there. Of course, your college days, too, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, you had your brother in high school, but you actually got to play a little bit of college ball at Cortland with your brother as well. Yeah, yeah he was the he was the starting right tackle for uh, for three of my seasons. You know, they're my three starting seasons there. Now, unfortunately, I lost I lost one of those to injury and he lost another one to injury. But we played together for the you know full season in that my last year there. Uh, and that was a great, just an awesome experience because we never crossed over in high school. You know, we never were on the same team uh, with him being three years behind me. But uh, so that was that was a lot of fun. I'm sure it was great for my parents and my family to be able to come, you know, see us play together. Um, and uh, I, I appreciated him uh, protecting me. I know that. <clears throat> so the uh, NFL career began, as you said, with the Indianapolis Colts. Uh, couple of years as a scouting assistant. How did that, that job come about and uh, how did you get hired to, to get into the coaching ranks there? Yeah, I had, I had developed a relationship with um, coach Paul Alexander uh, during my time here at Cortland. He's actually a Cortland graduate himself. Um, and he was the long time uh, offensive line coach for the Bengals at the time. And so, you know, I, I had kind of developed a relationship with coach. He gave me some advice on how to start my coaching career. And he actually connected me with the general manager at the time in Indianapolis, a guy by the name of Ryan Grigson. Um, and Ryan offered me a position as a scouting assistant, uh, that April, it was like 20, 2012, I believe was, was when that was. Um, and so it was a little bit of a, um, circuitous route to where I wanted to get because I knew I wanted to be a coach, but I also knew opportunities to get into the NFL were few and far between. And I wasn't willing to uh, pass this one up, even though it meant going the scouting route initially. Um, and so I took the job and I took, you know, I, I took the approach of I'm going to just keep my head down and work as hard as I can and learn how to be a great scout, how to evaluate talent um, and do anything I can for anybody in the building. And hopefully down the road, an opportunity to, to cross over into coaching would present itself. Um, and that's, you know, that kind of happened, you know, a couple of years down the road, really year three in Indianapolis is when I started to work a little bit with the coaching staff and then, you know, a lot more in year four while still kind of maintaining my scouting duties. So uh, it was, it was a way in the door. I'm grateful for the people that, that gave it to me. And, um, you know, I think my approach that way paid off. <laughs> And of course, I spent a few years there with Indi- absolutely few years, few years with Indianapolis, you know, through like 2015, I believe it was. And yep. it wasn't long after that, uh, you found your way to the Cincinnati Bengals. And uh, what was that, the transition, you know, to where the Bengals? I know you ended up, uh, you've kind of had a fun fun route with uh, Cincinnati. I mean, you can you start because you actually end up when you eventually joined them, you uh, started out working with the receivers, you know, the, the other end of what the, court, you know, the quarterback is dealing with. Yep. Yeah, it was, um, you know, I, I took the job there in January 2016 uh, as, as really kind of an offensive quality control coach. And then uh, spending my the time I was with a certain position, I was with the receivers, like you mentioned. So I was kind of in and out of the receiver room and then the quarterback room. I kind of bounced back and forth for, you know, my first three years, uh, really my first four years in Cincinnati. I spent two in the receiver room, two in the quarterback room, kind of alternating on and off based on where they, you know, where the offensive coordinator at the time uh, or the head coach best thought that my services could be used. Um, 
and then, you know, uh, took the quarterback job before last season. But yeah, being, being in the receiver room was, was great. Um, it, it taught me a lot. It, it, you know, exposed me to different phases of the game that you're not necessarily exposed to in the quarterback room. Um, and allowed me to learn from some, you know, really good coaches and, and allowed me to work with some, some pretty special players. So I'm grateful for that opportunity. And, um, you know, always kind of knowing in the back of my mind, I wanted to coach the quarterbacks. Uh, but I, I know that the experience I had working in that room was, was definitely valuable. And of course, uh, for people want to know who some of the guys you worked with, of course, one of them was, uh, end up getting a pro bowl, not in that 2017 season, uh, AJ green. So, what, you know, what was AJ like as far as, you know, you know, learning and, uh, you know, then you had a guys like, you know, uh, you know, you had other guys like jo uh, Josh Malone and John Ross, the third, or, you know, guys that jumped, jumped into the picture here and there, Tyler Boyd. Uh, but what was it like AJ? Cause AJ was at the top of his game back then. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you'd asked me before if I, you know, when I was done playing in college, if I had any uh, hopes or aspirations to play professionally, well, it's when you get around guys like AJ green that you realize how, uh, how special these guys are just in terms of their physical ability and how, how incredibly short, you know, that, that I, you know, I am in comparison to a guy like that. He's, uh, he's a world-class athlete. Um, he's, you know, one of the most explosive, um, you know, fast, quick twitch guys I've ever been around. Um, and he's got tremendous ball skills and, um, you know, he's, he's now moved on to, uh, to Arizona. Um, and, you know, I was wish him the, the absolute best in his career, but it was a pleasure to work with AJ and really see somebody up, up close and personal. that was, you know, at the top of his craft and really in the world. Um, you know, there's, there's few that, you know, have been able to play the position like he has in the NFL for, uh, you know, going on nine years now. So, uh, it was a lot of fun to be around him and, and some of those other guys you mentioned as well. I mean, it takes, it takes some special talent to, to get to that level, especially at that position, you gotta be a, a rare athlete. And, um, you know, those guys that you mentioned, they're definitely that. And the guy having some of his better, better years as well, uh, when you moved on and, Started working with the quarter the quarterbacks, uh, you know, in 2018. Of course, uh, you know, Andy Dalton. Of course, he went down, and it means you, then you get to bring a new guy along, Jeff Driscoll, a little bit, and get, help him get his uh, feet wet as far as uh, being a starting quarterback. But uh, what was uh, what was that 2018 season like with the you know, Dalton and the gang? It was it was great, you know, and and working with Andy was was awesome. Um, you know, Andy's one of the the best people I've ever you know I've had the, the opportunity to meet, you know, in, in a professional, uh, status. Um, and he's just, he's, he's a, he's a great person. He's an excellent player. Um, you know, kind of the things I guess I took from him were just, you know, his preparation process, how, you know, his organization, how he went about the day to day, the week to week, um, is really what has allowed him to play for as long as he has. Um, because Andy is tremendously talented, but, uh, it's, you know, as much as it is his physical ability that's got him where he is, it's his, it's his ability to process, to know what's coming from the defense, to make smart decisions uh, that's allowed him to have a sustained career. So learned a lot from Andy. Uh, it's been fun working really with all the guys that have come through that room. And, um, you know, you try to learn something from each of them and try to maybe, you know, just do your best in your role to help them be ready for their job, which, you know, to play that position at the professional level is, in, you know, in my opinion, is the most difficult thing to do uh, as a professional athlete. So they got a lot on their plate, that's for sure. Then in 2019, of course, Andy, Andy again, you know, threw for almost uh, 3,500 yards in the season. But was, again, it was, it was, that was one thing. It was a little inconsistency, 16 touchdowns, 14 interceptions. And it was a chance, again, where Ryan Finley, a rookie, got a chance to start a little bit in the middle of the season, threw for a close to 500 yards, a couple of touchdowns, a couple of interceptions, uh, even though it was a two and 14 season overall. Uh, so it was kind of, you know, a kind of a mixed bag for, again, as you know, trying to work with, a again, a, a veteran quarterback, and then also really having to prep that, uh, you know, a younger player to step in like, like Ryan, Ryan Finley had to do. Sure. It's, it's, it's a very different thing when you're working with, you know, a guy like Andy, who's, been in the league since 2011 um you know so he's got 10 years under his belt and then now you're 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 doing your best to try to help prepare a, a younger player 
who doesn't have anywhere near that amount of experience who, you know, the player you're referencing, Ryan, who's, who's a, a super intelligent guy himself, who's got, a, you know, really good football instincts and all those things. But there's something to be said for just the lived experience of, you know, uh, 150 plus starts in the league uh, versus zero starts in the league and all the things that you've seen during that time. And, um, you know, so you just, you kind of have to reframe your preparation process as a coach and, and, and maybe slow it down a little bit, um, you know, get a little simpler in terms of what, you know, what you're trying to do on offense and just making sure that that guy is out there uh, and you're not asking him to do too much and you've put him in, you know, the best position for, for him to succeed uh, which may be entirely different than a veteran quarterback, or it may be similar. So you're just kind of constantly balancing all those things to try to go out there and just, you know, give him the best chance he, he has to be successful. And then the big jump in, in, in the year of COVID, the big jump uh, head coach, Zach Taylor uh, named you as the, as the quarterback coach. Uh, you got, you know, the, the full promotion there for you to become uh, a cut, you know, the, the, that position, of course, and uh, Brian Callahan, the uh, offensive coordinator for the Bengals. So, uh, and again, you're talking about working with young guys. Um, you bring in, you know, the guys draft, of course, uh, the Heisman Trophy winner, uh, Joe Burrow. So what was uh, what what was it like that first year, you know, working with Joe? I know he ended up having a little dinged up during the, during the crazy season that it was too. But, you know, what was your first experience working with Joe Burrows? Well, Joe, uh, Joe's a special player. Um, and Joe's a, he's a, he's a rare uh, person, um, just with everything that he can process and, um, you know, just the, the things that he's able to remember and things that he's able to act on, uh, in a moment's notice, um, he can do some, some special things. And so that was something we identified about him really pretty early on in the scouting process from all the work that our scouts had done and from, you know, talking to people close to him and then getting a chance to actually spend some time virtually with him. Um, you know, those things become pretty evident quickly. And so those are, those are the kind of traits that, you know, allow guys to play a really long time uh, in this league. And so you know, Joe has those things and it's awesome working with a player who has those things because you can challenge him and you can put a lot on his plate and he wants a lot on his plate. Uh, and he's going to ask a lot of questions and, and you have to do your best to have the right answer for him. Um, and, and he's going to, you know, he understands so much about the game. He's a coach's son. He, you know, he grew up around the game. He understands defenses better, you know, than just about any other guy I've been around as a young player, you know, what the defense is trying to accomplish, where they're, where they're weak. If they're going to bring up you know, pressure from this side, well, they have to, be weak on this side they have to you know there's always a, a give and take with what they choose to do and he understands those things he gets the big picture so uh he's a he's a lot of fun to coach um and you know he's got a tremendous future ahead of him <laughs> does it help in, in, in his situation too like you know something you know yeah, you do. You get the high profile coach, you know, players from the high and of course LSU a high high you know profile program. Does it help that you know he come from a program like that to really be able to make that transition to the NFL? Absolutely. Yeah, it's very it's a hard enough position to play as a rookie in the NFL if if you haven't played at the absolute epitome of the highest level of college football. So that was big. The other thing, in my opinion, that was so big for Joe and, and which is going to be big for him moving forward is, you know, he didn't have the easiest road in college. He didn't, he didn't, you know, he, he went to Ohio state initially and he transferred from Ohio state and, and he never won the starting job at Ohio state. And so he could have reacted in any number of ways, but all that did was light a fire under him. Uh, he went down to LSU, he won that job. And then he took that team to a perfect season in a national championship. So he was able to overcome, some adversity that was presented to him initially in his college career, uh, which when you play in the NFL, I mean, there's, there are no perfect seasons. I mean, you're going to get hit with adversity time and time and time again. Um, and it's, how are you wired to overcome that? And he, he's got experience doing that. He did it already um, really in the most dramatic fashion that you could imagine doing it. Uh, so he's, he's particularly well suited for, um, what's, what came at him in, in one year. And unfortunately the injury suffered, 
just kind of adds on to that, just more adversity, more hurdles to overcome. But there's there are some people that will back away from that and cower when those things come up. And there's other people that will just step up and say, bring it on. And he's one of those guys. So it's it's been a lot of fun spending time with him. <laughs> so you guys basically have gone through like the mini camps, the OTAs now. Now so that little bit of downtime the NFL has, at least as far as the players are concerned, as far as getting ready for a training camp, you know, late July, early August. Um, how do Joe and the quarterbacks look this year for the Bengals? They look great. You know, we had a good, uh, we had four weeks of practice uh, in the off season program and, uh, you know, kind of tempered it a little bit in terms of what we, what we did as a full unit and the kind you know, the, the tempo that we went at, but uh, you know, they, they had a good, um, a good spring and, and Joe, Joe, looks really, really good uh, for the stage that he's at in his recovery. And, and, you know, we expect him to do a lot of really good things for us this season. So I couldn't be happier with where we stand there right now. And just looking forward to, you know, training camp starting up here in about a month and um, getting going. As I said, you came into the NFL as a, you know, uh, an assistant coach with a scouting team, then eventually, you know, kind of moved up the scouting ranks there with Indianapolis. Um, what what was your, a, a day like, you know, f- you know, as far as being a scout? And of course, obviously, game day, before I went out and scouted other games. But what you know, take us through a little bit what it's like, you know, you know, being a, being a pro scout in the NFL. Yeah, so scouting and coaching, your days are are very different. Um, in scouting, you know, I really had uh, when I when I became a pro scout, I was responsible for a quarter of the league. So I had eight teams that I was responsible really for knowing inside and out. Um, and so you have to prepare what are called advanced scouting reports. So if we're going to go play team, team a in two weeks, then I have to compile a report on all the players on team a, I got to watch all the tape. I got to write out a report, their strengths, their weaknesses, where can we how can we attack them? Um, and so that's part of being a pro scout. So you prepare that report for the coaches so that when, you know, the Monday of the week, we're getting ready to play their, that team, that report goes on their desk and they can use it however they need to use it for their preparation. Um, but the other part of it is you're learning, you know, you're studying all the potential free agents across the league, any potential, you know, guys that you may want to trade for at any point in time, guys that are, you know, aren't on a team currently, but have, you know, tape from preseason or from a prior season where, you, you know, okay, hey, all of a sudden we have an injury and we have to go sign up you have to send an offensive guard. Well, you know, you better know if there's an offensive guard that has come through any of those teams that, you know, general manager calls you up and say, Hey, what, what, you know, what about player X? Should we, you know, is this a guy we should bring in for a workout? Well, if you, if you played on one of my eight teams in the last year, then I'm responsible for having an answer for him. So it's really a lot of work on your own to study those teams um, and to keep a really a, a working database of, of who's playing for them. And, um, what you think of those players. And that's, that was kind of the scouting element. Um, and as you referenced, it also includes traveling to other, you know, other NFL games and watching them in person um, was kind of the other part of that as well. So there's, there's a lot of elements that go into that. It's, I definitely enjoyed it. Uh, it's different than coaching. I like coaching more, uh, but I learned a lot of valuable things as a scout. And how, how much diff, diff, more difficult would that job have been this past year when there there weren't you know that one year there weren't college games and you're, you know they saw the draft of course, of course Joe, Joe got drafted but you, you didn't there wasn't really a lot of in person stuff it was a lot of like you say tape or was it just kind of still kind of normal while we just study more tape and uh, things like that. Yeah, I, th- I think the tape part of it wasn't any different because all that stuff is shared virtually. So you can sit in your office in Cincinnati or Indianapolis or wherever you work and you get you know, the tape from every college game around the country very quickly. I think the part that changed drastically was um, for college scouts was not being able to go into those colleges and, you know, go to practice and, and looking at those guys in person with your own two eyes. Uh, talking to their coaches, talking to people around the program, trying to find out, um, you know, different things about these potential guys that you may or may not draft or look to add your team at some point. And so when they couldn't do that traveling and they couldn't get on campus and and do the face-to-face work, um, or at least not as much of it as they were used to doing, uh, that makes the process very different. It makes, makes it harder than those guys. And so um, it was, you know, it's been a different year 
you know, really it's affected two drafts now. Um, it affected the draft two years ago. And then this year as well, it affected this draft process uh, because of the COVID restrictions in the fall. So and hopefully as we get back to normal as a country, um, their job starts to you know, you know, become a little bit more um, like it was prior to it, you know, where they could do all those things without, without having an issue. As and what you said with the Bengals, you've been your receivers coach, and now the you know the, the head quarterback coach. What's uh, what's what's a daily routine with the uh, as far as being you know you know a, a position coach now? You know, especially working with the quarterbacks. Yeah, you know, so it just during the season it really varies based on what day. You know, there's um, you know early in the week on a Monday and Tuesday, the bulk of our time is spent game planning for the upcoming opponents, so we don't spend a lot of time with our players on those days. Uh, Monday, we'll review the game from the prior day, you know, and then Wednesday, Thursday, Friday are our big practice days. So you're, you know, you're in early, uh, you're preparing your meetings. Um, they can be long days, you know, during the season, you know, generally it's a, you know, a lot of times it's a 16, 17, sometimes 18 hour day, depending on the day of the week. Um, you know, and that's really for three days during the week. And then as the game gets closer, you start to kind of back off a little bit, you know, get a chance to catch up on some rest. Um, you know, before that game on Sunday, but, uh, you know, every coach kind of has this, their special area where they help to prepare the game plan. Mine was third downs last year. So I'm responsible for studying the opponent on third down, all the different defenses they bring, um, you know, what I think, you know, I, I have play suggestions that I think we should run, uh, on third down, you know, Hey, we should run this play on third and three, or we should run this play on third and eight. You know, and we meet and talk about those things, and uh, and then the head coach and the offensive coordinator decide. Okay, these are the these are the plays that we're going to carry for that section of the game plan, and uh, so you know you get a chance to you know really put your input in there and um, get a chance to run the meeting room with the quarterbacks and prepare all their cut ups and notes, and um, so it's it's a there's a lot that goes into it. I enjoy really every bit of it. Um, you know, I can't think of anything else I'd rather do. It's um, to me, like I said, it helps me scratch that competitive itch, um, that, uh, that I probably will have for my whole life. So, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. And your degree, your great degree from college, you know, you're, you got your bachelor's in psychology. Does that kind of, uh, seem like that would work well with dealing with, uh, with NFL players? Cause I know every, every player has a little different personality of their own. So, uh, having a degree in psychology, is that kind of help you uh, navigate the waters with these guys? Uh, yeah. You know, I think there, you know, I can't pinpoint any specific, you know, um, lesson I learned or class that I took that, you know, directly correlated, but, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not asking the guys to lay down on a couch and, uh, tell me about their childhood, but it's, uh, it's definitely just being able to, I guess, maybe, you know, understand people and understand the different motivations that go into, who we are as humans and, and the things that drive us um, and, and know that those things change from person to person and then from day to day within people. Um, and so just maybe having an appreciation for that and, and knowing that everyone's different. Um, you know, to me, I think the, the responsibility you have as a coach is to tailor your coaching to your athletes. It's not, in my opinion, their responsibility to tailor their learning style or their, uh, you know, preparation style to you as a coach, there's some healthy give and take when it comes to those things. But I think it's very important that you're able to relate to each individual um, and, and understand what motivates them and, and really understand how to get the best out of, out of all of them. So I do think that that background helps me there for sure. And of course, you went on, of course, during the 2011, you ended up in your master's in sports management. Does that uh, leads to the idea of any idea of uh, down the road, future, uh, agent or anything like that with uh in pro sports when your coaching days are over uh agent no no uh, uh and there's nothing against uh sports agents i've gotten to know many of them and they're good people uh it's just not a job that i would want um you know i did learn you know again a lot of stuff about the business of sports uh that i think you know kind of just help mold an overall understanding and philosophy when it comes to the job that I have now. So, um, you know, uh, I did being a football player and playing the position of quarterback was the single biggest factor that prepared me for the job that I have now. 
that being said, those degrees and the classes that I took and the people that I met through that process absolutely have helped me get to where I am as well. So um, it's, it's just you take a little bit of, you know, from everybody you meet and, and hopefully it, it gets you to where you want to go. So as we said, we're coming, you know, coming, coming totally out of the uh, COVID uh, pandemic, you know, more getting out and getting around, not cooped up in the house all the time or anything. But uh, what's it been like the last the last year with you doing your job? And of course, you and uh, Marissa pretty much being at home together, your wife. Yeah, it was uh, it was hard, you know, and, and there were some pretty strict um, restrictions that the NFL put in place with regard to employees and what they could and could not do uh, during the season. You know, so I, I tested every single day from July, whatever, 20th of last year until the season was over. So I had to get a COVID test every single day. Um, I, you know, had to, you know, travel was, was restricted, um, you know, time away from the facility, you know, you couldn't go to you know, a restaurant with more than 10 people there. You couldn't go, you know, to another big event. Like there was all these things that they had set in place just to try to keep people COVID free and allow the seasons to, to proceed. Um, and so it was, it was hard, um, you know, but, you know, ultimately my job's very important to me. And so I was willing to do whatever I needed to do to, um, you know, stay healthy myself and then, you know, avoid putting any of my players at risk. You know, that was the main concern that I had was I, God forbid, I, you know, if I were to, you know, if I was to contract COVID and then all of a sudden I'm putting, you know, the quarterbacks at risk of getting it and that, you know, in turn putting our team in a bad spot. So that was, that was, I wanted to avoid that at all costs. Uh, but it definitely, you know, led to some changes in our lifestyles and, and hopefully those are, you know, pretty much in the past now, we're still obviously being, being intelligent about how we approach the day to day, um, but but eager to get back to you know something that looks more like normal. <clears throat> and of course, there's a lot of time you do spend having to do things. You know, as to, even in the off season as a coach, you guys do a lot of things. But did you get any uh, any binge watch? You and Marissa get any binge watching in that uh, you uh, got hooked on while you were uh, in between things? Uh, we get our share of. Uh, of Netflix and uh, HBO and all those things in. So yeah, we uh, trying to think of the last thing we, um, we watched. Now it's escaping me. There's a show on HBO mayor of East town. I think we watched that. That was a good one. Uh, but uh, yeah, we try to get downtime when we can. Um, and uh, you know, definitely get catching a, a good series or something like that on, on one of those streaming services is a good way to do that. So as you said, so when does uh, one will training camp open for the Bengals now? Uh, July 23rd will be um, really our first as a staff when we got to be back in the office. The 24th will be quarterbacks, rookies, and injured players. And then the 27th is our reporting date for all veterans. So, And I think that's going to be uniform across the entire league this year, which is a little bit different. In the past, there have been kind of different reporting dates for different teams, but think they're going to try to make it a little more uniform. Um, so end of July, we'll be, we'll be ready to go. We got the next month or so to kind of kick back and relax and, and, you know, charge the batteries up for what was a, it's a pretty long season. Um, so you got to get yourself mentally prepared for that. And uh, we will be. Yeah. And it's a new, the new uh, 17 game schedule this year. You know, last year it was 17 or 18 weeks to get 16 games in. Now they've, they've taken away a, that's two things. They've taken away some pre, a preseason game and they've added a regular season game. How much is that going to change your approach to first getting ready for the season and then, you know, factoring in an extra game in a regular season? Um, you know, I don't really know. I, I don't think it's going to change much, um, but I don't know for sure. I'll uh, have a better answer for you a year from now, uh, whether or not it really affected how we um, – you know, prepared it, you know, ultimately, like you said, it's, it's still, it's still 20 games. It's just, they've taken one away from the preseason and added one to the regular season. Um, the difference becomes, you know, and, and those preseason games, a lot of times your starters aren't playing, you know, and so you've taken away a game where, you know, it's maybe sometimes it's backups or guys fighting for a roster spot playing and you've added a, a real game to, to your schedule. So, um, you know, we'll see. I don't anticipate it having much of a difference, um, you know, in regard to how we prepare or anything like that. But, 
it just gives us one more chance to to go out and win a win a ball game and, and try to get to the playoffs and accomplish our goals. <laughs> and the hardest part, you kind of alluded to it, the hardest part would be for those rookies and those, you know, somebody on the fringe trying to make the team, you have one less one less opportunity to, to really show what you can do because like you said, you are probably gonna have to play the starters a little bit more in one at least one of the preseason games just to get them ready for you know the 17 game season. Yeah, you know, it, with that being said, it's they're still going to have three more preseason games than they had at all last year. They didn't have any last year. So I, I really felt for those rookies last year, those undrafted players who were, you know, normally, you know, the preseason, everybody kind of picks on the preseason. But uh, for those guys that are scratching and clawing to, to make it as, you know, as, as players, um, that's their lifeblood. You know, that's their opportunity to show what they can do. So it'll be nice to have that back this year for those guys. Um, and, you know, helps helps you get ready as a, as a team for sure, but it also helps, you know, those players that are vying for the last couple of roster spots to to go earn a living. Um, and so I think that's important. And, I'm, you know, looking forward to those guys having a chance to do that. And how's it been working, you know, with, with Coach Taylor and everybody? How's, you know, the, the coaching staff been, you know, since you've, you know, been elevated, you know, last year? Yeah, he's outstanding. Um, he's, he's really, you know, I – I didn't have much of a relationship with Zach prior to him, you know, keeping me on when the staff changed over from Marvin to Zach. Um, and he's been, I mean, I couldn't have asked for anything better, you know, with regard to how he's treated me and the opportunities he's given me, none of which he had to do because he, like I said, he didn't really know me. Uh, but I think we've grown to work well together. I think hopefully I've earned his trust um, and he's kind of just added more and more responsibilities uh, to my plate as we've gone. So uh, Zach's a great guy to work for. Uh, he's, you know, he's not, uh, he's not standing over your shoulder, breathing down your neck. He trusts that you're going to do what you need to do to have your position prepared. And uh, so from that standpoint, it's been outstanding working, working for Zach and hopefully I get a chance to keep doing so for a long time. Any aspirations in the future to possibly become like the offensive coordinator or defensive coordinator or, Possibly a head coach down the road. I mean, you're still yeah, fairly absolutely. young in this part of the career. Would you like that opportunity down the road to, you know, take over? A Absol- yeah, a- absolutely. I would. Um, that's, that's a definite goal of mine. Um, but I understand that to get there, I need to excel in the role that I have now. And so that's where all of my efforts are pointed towards. Um, I have a tremendous opportunity to, to be one of, you know, 32 uh, quarterback coaches in the NFL um, and, you know, really just be able to um, just attack that job every day and, and prove my worth in that role. And hopefully that will garner some, you know, attention at some point in the future, you know, to maybe have an an opportunity to be a coordinator or or maybe someday be a head coach. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm just really uh, focused on that. And, and, but I'm not, I'm not shy to, to say that, you know, that that is a goal of mine uh, for the future as well. So all this began, we said many, I can say it's been a long time since you've been out of high school, just 2005, but of course, even before then uh, you kind of got your first taste of football and everything. It was, you know, those sometimes Saturday, I think it could be really Friday and Saturdays, both maybe, or I think it's how the days went. Um, playing small fry football and you got to play on a down here, down in Cortland, at, you know, Dexter park, Gary Woodfield, uh, you know, and then you, but it, you're, you're playing on a field named after a guy who went on to be the quarterback for the New York giants, of course, game from the area. But uh, what, take this back. What you know, what was the excitement of those, those early days for Dan Pitcher becoming, you know, a, a football player? Well, I just, I think that's where you really kind of, that, that love for the game, that flame gets lit, you know, inside you as a little kid, you know, you run around the backyard and you play with your friends and then, okay, all of a sudden now you get a chance to go play on a real football team and you get a chance to go be the quarterback of that real football team. And, you know, and, you know, your parents and your friends and everybody are up there in the stands cheering for you. And so I think that's where, you know, you kind of, it kind of molds you as a, as a, as a young child um, and, and really gives you that, you know, lights the flame, like I said. And so that's, that's definitely where it happened for me. And uh, I'm grateful for 
you know, the people that helped me early on and put me in those positions and uh, have been supporting me ever since. So, you know, namely my parents, my brother, um, you know, people that kind of just believed in me all the way along. And, um, you know, I try to just make them proud every day. So uh, it's, it's been fun. With a lot of people, like I said, we're, I'm watching a lot of the high school programs around here, more and more of JV programs have dwindled. There are no couple more teams this year that were 11 man teams and might go eight man football now because that's become popular. to just start numbers there, but a lot of it's people are worried about injuries in football. And of course, youth football has really made great strides towards, you know, safety and everything. What, so what's your, some of your thoughts? You know, somebody, you know, on the fence, well, well should my kid, you know, I really don't want my kid to play football. You're not tall, like, you know, I'll, I'll just I'll throw out the name Bob Avery at Homer. He ran and he put his head down and ran over people. That's how he was taught to play, play football that way. And uh, But everything now, it's, it's more safety-oriented. Everything is about keeping heads up and different different things. Are you happy with the where, where the football, you know, pro football is going to, you know, support, you know, the youth programs and, you know, teach them the right way to do things now? Yeah, and I think for me – you know, football has, has really been such a central part of my life and it's helped me become the person that I am. And I think it teaches values of sacrifice and hard work and things that translate outside of the game. And so those are things that to me are incredibly important. And so if I was trying to convince a parent or somebody of the, of, of, of the positive side of the game of football, I would start there. Uh, before I ever even started with the game itself and, and what the opportunities that, that it can open for, for certain people. Um, so I am pleased that steps have been made to make the game safer. Um, I think that, that coaching at the youth level is critical uh, when it comes to you know, developing the proper habits and the proper techniques to keep young players safe um, and to help limit the chance at things like concussions um, and, and, th- you know, injuries that are serious and that can have lasting effect. Um, but not, you know, there's always going to be risk in whatever you choose to do. If you're doing anything active, no matter what sport you're choosing to play or what activity you're, you're, you're choosing to take part in. Um, and so it's just on each individual and, and parents, when you're talking about young kids to weigh those risks and for me, I would say that the benefits far outweigh the risks when it comes to the sport of football. Uh, as long as the proper techniques are being taught um, and the proper safety measures are in place to keep young kids safe as they learn the game. Um, and so if those things are there, then the benefits of a sport like football to me are far outweigh the, the negatives. This year, of course, Cortland and I had their had one of their best seasons in a long time. And of course that we were joking, you know, when was the last time Homer and Cortland played the court, the home court jug game when both teams were, uh, I think they're both two and over three and all at the time when they two and over, they have, they're both two and over when they played each other. It's like, it's, you don't see that. And um, so what advice could you pass on to that uh, high school kid, you know, that's not, you know, playing, you know, and wants to maybe go on to play football in college and, and beyond what advice could you uh, hand out to some kids now? You know, it's, to me, it's that you have to decide what's important to you. Um, And there's going to be a lot of different things that will compete for your time and your attention. And if being a, an athlete is important to you and being the best athlete that you can be is important to you, then you need to choose to dedicate the time to it uh, because it's not just going to happen. There are certain, you know, people and who are, you know, who have a lot of God-given ability who it may be easier for. There are others that are going to have to scratch and claw. But even those people that have a tremendous amount of God-given ability, they're going to eventually get to a level where everybody else has that same amount of ability. And so how far do you want to go and how much are you willing to work? Um, And so if you can establish those work habits early on, they're going to carry you through. And they'll get you as far as your ability can possibly get you. Uh, If you don't establish those habits, you're probably going to end up falling a little bit short of where you could have been. Uh, And so to me, it's about developing those, the discipline, the hard work, uh, the sacrifice 
the ability to say, hey, if I if I really care about this and I, I want to go as far as I can go, then there are certain things that I'm just going to have to say no to. There are certain things that I'm just going to have to deprioritize in my life for this period of time because I know what's important to me and I know where I want to go. Um, and so, you know, for young athletes, those are, can be hard decisions to make. Um, and hopefully there's, they have people in their life that can guide them through those decisions. Uh, but if it's important to you, you have to make it important. You have to make it a priority. <clears throat> and like we said, we talked about, you know, hopefully moving up as far as a head coach or whatever else in the NFL, but any thought that might one day they court on high say, well, if you're done coaching, you know, or say you're done with your NFL career, we could use you to come back and teach, 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 you know, be a coach here at the high school would you uh consider coming back to your alma mater and do some coaching are you there or suny Cortland? well certainly if i'm ever find myself back in the area for for any extended period of time i would um you know definitely consider that you know i think you know right now i've got a i've got a window to pursue you know my my professional aspirations is uh you know as, as far as i can and that's what I plan to do for the foreseeable future. Um, you know, and then in the meantime, you know, hopefully I can, you know, um, garner attention and give back to the programs that helped me get to where I got, um, and, and trying to, you know, help out that way. Um, but, uh, you know, you never know. <laughs> well, Dan, we want to thank you uh, for taking time to uh, talk to us today. No problem, Tom. Thank you for having me. And that'll do it for this edition of TV on the Net. Today's show brought to you by AmeriQ Credit Union for every day, for everything. Located next to Little Caesars at 3944 Route 281 in Cortland. By Right Angle Creek Farm and Marathon. All natural, pasture-raised Angus beef from our farm to your table. By the Cortland Voice, the exclusive media partner of TV on Net. For all your local news and sports in Cortland County at no cost to you, check out CortlandVoice.com. By the Royal Auto Group on Route 281 in Cortland the home of no hassle, no razzle-dazzle. Check them out at royalautogroup.com. And by Yeaman Real Estate at the entrance to Yeaman Park off I-81, exit 11 in Cortland. So from my guest, Dan Pitcher, and yours truly, Tom Vartanian, thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you again soon. <laughs>